Hey, let's get into Judges chapter 1. Let's begin at verse 20. And um, the children of Israel right now, as you're turning there, as we lead into Judges chapter 1, and we've covered the first half of it pretty much, the children of Israel still need to get kind of into the land. They're in the land, and, and right now they needed to get those rooted Canaanites out of the land that were still left there. Now, the war, understand, was already won. Uh, the war was won. Joshua and the children of Israel went in, and they conquered the land, the land that God promised. But there was still work for them to do. There's these little, little fires, these little factions of Canaanites still in the land that they needed to eradicate, that they needed to get out of the land. And that's a lot what happens with you and me as well. You know, the, the war is won. The victory is done on the cross of G, with Jesus. Amen? It's done. The war is done. But there's little battles that you and I continue to fight in this life. And so even though the war and the land has been given over to us as his children, um, there's still work to be done. Work to be done in our lives. I mean, just think about it. If God just saved us and left us at that place, and that was it. Um, kind of like, what good would that do? There's no growth, there's no maturity, and really getting closer to Christ. Wow, he saved us, but God loves us so much, he doesn't just leave us in that state. So he wants us to go in, and, and as he's given us the land, he's given us our salvation, he wants us to go in and still do some work. And so that's what's happening to the children of Israel. But what happens in the first, very, very first verse of this chapter is the children of, As of Israel, they ask, you know, what are we to do now? You know, Joshua, our leader, is gone. We have no more leader. And he, he, along with Moses, for all of these years, has been leading us and guiding us. And the Spirit of God has been falling on them and, and in front of them. And they've, you know, and all these great things have been going on. But now they're left with no leader. So they do something really, really good. They inquire of the Lord. And that's what you and I need to do. When we don't know what's going on, when we have things going on around us, when stuff is happening, situations come around us, we need to, instead of fret about it, instead of fear, be fearful of it, we need to then say, Lord, I need to go to you. I need to go to you. And that's, that's a really good thing that the children of Israel did is they, they went to the Lord and they inquired of the Lord. And then the Lord says, uh, you know, Judah, Judah, you're the one that is to go first. You're the one that's to go in. And, 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 and take this land and take what's left. You're the first one to go in. Now, the, the name Judah means praise. And I think that's really fitting. And I think how right that is that, that it was to be this tribe, this family, as an example of praise that was to be demonstrated and praise was to lead the way. Do you understand where I'm going with this? You see, in a believer's life, for a child of God, we are to be led through praise, with praise, praising God in every step of the way. And this is, in my opinion, the only way. Because I believe that praise must be a priority in our lives as children of God. It must be a priority. It must be number one because this whole way of, of going in and having to do this work, I mean, it, it works for them and it works for us as well. And the same thing is going to happen to us as we're going to go into different situations. We need to be walking into it with praise. So praising paves the way. Let praise be that area in your life that takes you places that God wants you to go. Let praise be that. Lift up your hands, bow to your knees, and praise the Lord. When you're blue, when you're down and out, when you feel kind of melancholy, kind of forlorn, and maybe kind of alone, the thing that should lead you into his presence is praise. That's why it's so fitting that Judah be that tribe that leads the first time going in at this, this new juncture, this new, this new uh, way of doing their lives without their leader. Here they are. They're walking in with praise. They begin their walk without Joshua because he's died. Yet they begin their walk, as we studied last week, with only partial obedience. 
God said, Judah, you go in. Judah, you begin. You lead the way. But then Judah asks his brother, Simeon, hey, come with me. Come join me. That wasn't what God said. That wasn't how God directed them. He also said, hey, when you go into this land, as it's been said from the day one, he says, you go in and you, you destroy those in the land. But instead, what did we find out they did? They disabled the king. They cut off the thumbs and the big, the big, toe of, uh, big toes of the king. So they only disabled him. And what does this tell me? And it should tell you as well. They didn't really believe the word of the Lord. Because God had said that he had, he had taken care. He had delivered them into their hands. And so we left off last week in verse 19... And it says, so the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the mountaineers, but but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Why? Because they had chariots. Oh, wow. You look at those words in verse 19, and as in back in verse 2, and three, actually verse 3 of this chapter, was the beginning of that slow fade of faith because of what God had promised they still didn't quite believe and now what happens in our lives too as Christians is when we begin not fully believing God at his word maybe living a Christian life of 80 20 80 percent of the time I believe you and follow you yet 20 percent of the time I'm not so sure. I don't know if I could do that. Think maybe I'll do it my own way, just like they did with that king. Well, it says in verse 19, but they could not drive out. Ultimately, they didn't drive them out. And the reason is, is because there were chariots of iron The Lord had waited 400 years for this to happen. You see, Judah was successful in the mountains. Yet Judah was defeated and discouraged in the valley. That's where this took place. Because they had chariots. Remember, it says, the inhabitants of the lowland. Those in the valley. But in the mountains, it says, so the Lord was with Judah and they drove out the mountaineers. Those up there, they drove them out. Yet in the lowland, in the valley, they were defeated and discouraged. You know, and I think that happens with you and me too. We have these mountaintop experiences and we either go to a retreat or we are coming to church or we're in a Bible study or something happens to where we have that incredible mountaintop experience. And we feel like, Lord, we have conquered these things in my life. I have conquered these things with with you here showing me what I must do. And I've got my marching orders. But then we head from the mountain into the valley and say, oh, but there are chariots of iron. There's chariots of iron. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You see, the problem with the children of Israel is that they were keeping their eyes on chariots and they were not keeping their eyes on the Lord. Psalm 68, 17 says, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. You see, as long as they were looking up and they were going, looking up, it's like, oh Lord, there we are. We're up in the mountain place. We're in that high place. Yes, we're victorious. But then we go to this low place. We go to this valley and, oh, they have chariots of iron. As I said, God had waited so long, some 400 years, for, for this to happen, to be done by His people. Yet, Remember the idea, and as we study this in context, the idea of leaving these particular 
uh, other peoples in the land, these other peoples represent sin. And when God says, go and eradicate sin in your life, He means all of it. He doesn't mean to disable it. He doesn't mean just to kind of keep it in check. But God says, disable it. Or God says, don't disable it, but kill it. Kill the sin. Destroy the sin. They allowed leaven to remain in the land. Deliberate disobedience from God. And you and I may not think we're being deliberately disobedient, but know this, when you don't do what God asks, you're being deliberately disobedient because you know what he's asked you. And yet we fail to believe that he's delivered us already. And so we, we don't enter in. We don't enter in and have praise Judah lead our way. Verses 22 through 26, it goes on, or actually 20, it says, and they gave Hebron to Caleb as Moses had said. Then he expelled from there the three sons of Anak. But the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem. So the Jebusites dwell within, with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And the house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Luz. Verse 24, And when the spies saw a man coming out to the city, they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city, and we will show you mercy. Verse 25, so he showed them the entrance to the city and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but but they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, and called its name Luz, which is, which is its name to this day. You see, God had originally said, as we've talked about, wipe them out, kill them all. Yet, here we see the, the children of Benjamin, uh, the house of Joseph, um, here running across this guy, and they're allowing him to escape, and not only escape, but he ends up building a whole other city, and he calls it the same exact name. You see, the sons of Joseph, they couldn't figure out how to get around and in this city. It was a high-walled city. And so they're looking for ways to get in it. But they happen to see a guy going in and out a certain way. And they hit up this guy and they say, you know, if you show us the way in, because guess what? We have all these folks here and we're going to sooner or later come in anyway. But if you show us in the way that you go in and the way that you go out, we'll spare you. We'll, we'll give you mercy so, he says, if you show us, guess what? We'll give you mercy. He does. They destroy the city. And this guy has mercy from them. And they let him go. Now, one would think, I think you and I would think, maybe, maybe not all of us, but hopefully we would, is like, wow, look what God has delivered me out of. You see? This man who was shown incredible mercy by Joseph, by the tribe of Joseph, it's like, hey, man, God is with you. God is obviously powerful. And you have spared me. You have given me mercy because the God that you follow has given mercy to me. And and. I would think that this man would be one to say, you know what, I want to stay with you. Because if you show me mercy in this situation, oh, you, you must follow a really good God. But instead, he doesn't stay with them. Instead, he goes to a whole other place and he starts a city named Luz. It's the same exact place 
That's all that he came from. I think about this, and I think about this, it's like people, like you and me. God has been so good to them. God has been so good for them. And you'd think that they'd want to be a part of the people of God. Just because of how wonderful God has been to them and for them. But instead, they go right back doing their old thing. Doing the same old thing. Doing it with their same old cronies. Only to redo their old thing once again. You know, when the body of Christ has been so incredibly good to them, yet they choose to leave. They choose to forsake the body of Christ, that of which was one that was so loving and so gracious to them. And they leave. Yet they go right back and they begin building the thing that was in their lives or a part of their lives before they, they, they got here to begin with. I mean, it's like, why? Why does this happen? I don't know. I have no idea why the goodness of God doesn't keep people. I don't know why the goodness of His people, when shown in love, and the love of Jesus, what's the one thing I always say to us all is, hey, show the love of Jesus. Show the love of Jesus. And when we show the love of Jesus, or you show the love of Jesus, and you pour into someone's life, and you pour in, and you pour in, and you pour in, and then something goes on to where they go right back. They go right back. I have no answer for you on that. I don't know. But what I can explain to you a little bit and what I can encourage you in is don't be surprised when it happens. There's nothing to be surprised at that is when you let people in and you show them such a wonderful thing or the wonderful things of the Lord and yet they go back to build their old cities the same again. And they build it in the same type of soil. It's very much like the parable of the soils or the parable of the hearts. Those of which fall on good soil, fractured soil, trodden soil, and soil that then is fallen by the wayside. Like the soils or like the hearts, some will possibly go back. Some will Uh, uh, go back to their former ways of life. But yet some will have that good soil, that good heart. And what happens is, is they do stay. They do maintain their lives here with you. So in witnessing or evangelizing, whatever it is, just know it's a reality. It's the way it's going to happen. It's the way things work out. Verse 27, however, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. And I want you to notice in these these remaining verses, 27 through 36, um, the did not. However, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its villages, or Tanakh and Its villages are the inhabitants of Dor and its villages are the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages are the inhabitants of Megiddo and the villages or the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. You know, I think that's an underlying word that that we're determined. Because like we see that these different inhabitants of the land are a picture of sin. Sin is very determined to stay in your life. The determination of the Canaanites, in this case, was more than the Israelites. They didn't want to budge. And sin 
like the Canaanites, is determined to stay in your land if you are not determined more to eradicate it, to eliminate it, to destroy it. You just can't um, uh, back up, retreat, cave in, give in, and let it rule your life. You can't. God has delivered you and and gives you a much better life. God will eradicate things in our lives quickly. He will. And at times, He also won't. It's for a purpose. God knows what's best for you and for me. And ultimately, He'll be glorified. He'll be glorified through it and by it. Your determination to obey God is to be greater than the determination of sin itself. I remember a teaching by Damien Kyle that I laugh at because what he says is there are times in his life to where he has to look in the mirror every morning for whatever period or whether it's a one-time thing that week and he has to look in the mirror and just say no really loud. No. No. And he says, no. And his wife's wondering, what are you doing again? But he's saying, no, I'm not going to let that thing which continues to stumble me, stumble me anymore. I'm not going to let that thing which distracts me, distract me anymore. No, I'm not going to cave into it. I'm not going to let it get the best of me. And I believe that's what we're talking about here. I truly believe that if we allow sin to remain in our land, in your lives, in my life, it is determined enough to stay there and unfortunately it's it's determined enough to grow and to manifest itself, to show itself in many other aspects in our lives. We must be ruthless with sin as God is ruthless with the Canaanites. We might think, oh, gee, isn't that kind of harsh on God that he wants every man, woman, and child and animal to be killed? God does it for a reason because if you let the littlest amount of leaven in your life, if we leave the littlest amount of leaven in the land, it will ultimately grow and spread. God said, I don't want anything anything um, in, um, how can I put it? I don't want anything, I just lost my word. Um, Well, he doesn't want anything, and I'm blank. (laughs) He doesn't want anything to affect them. He doesn't want it to infiltrate He doesn't want it to sneak in, because it will. You give sin an opportunity, and guess what? It takes its opportunity to just get in. That's the truth. And so as we see this here, and we've seen this kind of slow slide away from believing the Word of God, believing Him, you have to be careful, Christian about sin remaining in your land. Because sin will grow. Sin will take over. It's like that that kudzu plant in Alabama and Georgia and those places. Grows a foot a day. Takes over everything and difficult to eradicate at best. But if you let it grow, it will take over. So your determination to obey God is to be greater than the determination of sin. Now here's the change in verse 28. And it came to pass when Israel was strong and they put the Canaanites under tribute, but did not completely drive them out. Hmm. What they're saying is, well, we can let the sin stay. I can deal with it. I can work with it. You know, I can through prayer. You know, it's going to stay there. It's kind of in my life. I still haven't 
ask the Lord to deliver it from me. But you know what? I can handle it. I'll even pray and ask God to give me strength to kind of work through it. Well, that's not how it works. God says, get it out. God says, eliminate it. We can't let the sin stay. You and I, we cannot make allowances for our sin. Oh, I don't do it all the time. Oh, well, I only do it when I get down, so I'll be happy. Or I only do it when, when I, I feel bad, so I'll, I won't feel bad anymore. Or I only feel it when I drive down this particular street. Now, I won't drive down that street anymore. And, or I talk to this one person. You know, those little tricks don't work. Sin is ruthless. And you must take care of things as much as it wants to take care of you. You must be ruthless with it. You can't let sin stay. This is what they're doing here in verse 28. The inhabitants of the land, they're supposed to be driving them out. That's the idea. Earlier was the 80-20 rule, partial obedience. Earlier, we saw that there was despair and, and, uh, in the valley. But now we see something fully different, a different problem they've allowed. See, it's not that they could not, it's just that they would not drive them out. And then it controls them. That's what they want. They're saying, well, you know what? We can control these folks here in our land and we'll make them pay to us tribute. Basically, tribute is just a fee, a tax. They're going to pay tribute to you or to me, they say. No problem. We can control it. We can control their activity. We can control everything about them. Think about sin in your life. How, how good are you at controlling sin in your life? I tell you what, I'm lousy at it. I fail every time I try and take the bull by the horns myself and I try and deal with sin myself, allowing it to stay here, but you know what? It's going to pay tribute to me. I fail miserably at it. And I know I'm no different than you all here tonight. We, 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 we can't let this happen. We can't... We have no ability to control the situation. We can't control the problem. But too often than not, we do or try because we sometimes have those little pet areas of sin in our life that no one knows about. Yet we foster it, we take care of it, we feed it. It's not a big sin in my life. It's a little sin in my life. That's dangerous when you start breaking up giving levels of sin. Oh, this isn't a bad one. This isn't as bad as that person's sin. You start comparing yourself. You start, you start looking at someone else's sin and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. Have you ever done that? I, I, I've done that. Be honest, right? I've done that. It's like, no, man, at least I'm not as bad as him. As far as God's concerned, sin is sin. Sin is sin. There's no two ways about it. You and I, ultimately, we cannot control sin. It will control us. Verse 29 through 36, Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. So here, Ephraim. They don't dwell, uh, drink, drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. So the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol. Uh, so the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under tribute again. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or uh, Alab or Akzib, or Helba, or Aphek, or Rahab. So the Ashtarites dwell among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. 
Nor did Nephtali drive out the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh or the inhabitants of Bet Anath, but they dwelt among the Canaanites. The story is exactly the same. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Bet Shemesh and Bet Anath were put under tribute. Here we go again. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down into the valley. And the Amorites were determined, there's that word again, to dwell in Mount Harris in Ajalon and Shalblim, Shalbim. Yet this, when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute. Now the boundaries of the Amorites was from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah and upwards. I don't know what you guys see when you read those scriptures, but what I see is an incredible amount of compromise. Incredible amount of compromise. Now it doesn't appear, as we read this, that all is lost. That, ah, it's not such a big deal after all. Look, they were able to control them. They were paying tribute. They kind of, you know, it's like, well, it's better to watch a fox than in the hen house, right? That's where you see the fox because that's where the fox would normally go to get the hen. So if you're, you're watching the fox, well, that's the better place to watch them. No, you've got to kill the fox. It's my understanding. Or they'll get at the chickens. See, the account continues from this chapter on. And this account will continue and grow into where the children of Israel are placed into bondage. Because it's a future thing here. Everything they do now plays a part and sets the stage for the future. You and I, we are not smarter than sin. You and I, we are not wiser than any compromise. The problem is this, that the things, the sin or the compromise in our lives, those things don't stay in their rightful place. You know, sin wants to get at every part of you. It's like a cancer. It's not content to be isolated or stay in just one particular location of your body. It wants to get in and it wants to destroy you and all of you. And that is exactly what sin is if we allow it to remain in our lives. Remember the determination of the Canaanites. Remember the determination of sin. It is greater than you and I are. And without he who is greater in us, greater in the world, it's like, you know what? Without Christ, without following his word and believing his word and having that faith and walking in faith and praise into the Lord, we are destined for captivity. We're destined for bondage. You see, and that's what Jesus does for you and for me. That's why it's so important that we, we know who Jesus is and we know what Jesus can do in our lives and that if we just follow who Jesus is and we follow what Jesus says and we follow his words and we follow his examples, then guess what? Then we can live a victorious life over sin. You and I have the ability to never sin. You understand that? You have the ability to never sin because you have the Spirit of God that dwells inside you. You have that ability. Greater is He than in us than in the world. The Spirit of the living God dwells inside of you. You have the power over sin. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is certainly weak, isn't it? But sin has greater odds of captivating and taking over your life. If you know and you've acknowledged sin in your life and you're not willing to kill it, you're not willing to eradicate it, you're not willing to kick it out of your life, it will take over. And like I said, Sin is not respective of any boundaries. 
It will infiltrate every part of your life. It will infiltrate your life, your relationship with God, your relationship with your wife or husband, your relationship with your family, your relationship with your church family, your relationship with your friends, your relationship with your co-workers, because sin will get into your mind, sin will get into your heart, sin will just continue to rule and take over the land and take over the land of your life. That is the idea, that is the MO of sin. If you know This is to the Williamsburg family. If you know that you have sin in your life, you must kill it. You must kill it. Because it will kill you. That's a promise. Because that is exactly what sin is all about. That's what sin is all about. You can't just say, oh, I'll keep it over here or I'll keep it over there. I'll keep it. I know it's there, but I don't go to it all the time. And you know what? It's only taken over this kind of part of my mind. But you know what? A little bit of leaven ruins the entire lump. That's what the Bible says. You see, ultimately it's this, guys, that God loves you. God loves you with an immeasurable, incredible love. And he wants to drive these things out of your life that will dominate you, that will overtake you, and that will keep you, meaning preventing you, from knowing and experiencing a victorious life in Christ. He loves you so incredibly much. God says, give it to me. Give me this sin. Let me deal with it. Remember, who's our advocate? Jesus. You must know that Jesus is the only one who can deliver you from anything. Don't be fooled. God knows all about sin. He knows all about it. He knows what it looks like. He knows the effects it has on you. He knows its desire in your life. He knows what its goal is. But God died so that you can have the power over sin. And you can have the power over compromise in your life. God is giving you the power. You see, like the children of Israel that we begin reading in chapter 1, they began by not believing God's word, faith. Then they began the slide of the 80-20, obedience. Partial obedience is still full disobedience. Then they begin compromising. And you see, the scriptures paint for us a picture of a slow fade, a slow slide downward, backwards, to where before Joshua died, man, they were on top of the world, victorious, living that victorious Christian life, so to speak. God has given you the God died so that you could have the power over sin. Otherwise, you make his death meaningless. Malcolm Wild, at the most recent, he pastors Calvary Chapel, Merritt Island, really spoke to my heart because he he spoke on the Spirit of God and how important it is for each of you and myself to know and to have the Spirit and to know the Spirit of God dwells within you and that by Him dwelling in you, He has given you the power of His Spirit. He said this, and I quote, We in the church, I can't say it with this cool accent though. He's got a great accent. 
He says, we in the church must not only be stirred by the Spirit, but also empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to do the work of the Lord. If our light is to burn bright, then our oil must be from God. He has promised us His inexhaustible power and enabling to do the things He's called us to do in the ministry. You must not only be stirred by the Holy Spirit and blessed that He dwells in you, but you must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do His work. If you are to burn brightly for Jesus, then the oil must be the oil of the Holy Spirit that's in your life. That's what gives light. And he says that he's promised it to us. It's inexhaustible. That means it's never ending. It never gets tired. It never gets worn out. It's inexhaustible. It's always at your fingertips to to want, to have, to receive. It's always there for you, always, without end. God never holds back those things from us. And the purpose is to do the things that he's called you to do. That's the purpose. You see, with Jesus having his spirit, being stirred by it, it's not enough in my book. But you must know about the power of God. Because it's by the power of God that you will believe what His Word says and then you will do what His Word says. You follow me? It's this power that is that you know what He says is true and then you can overcome whatever it is in your life. Hey, even it's just a life of obedience to His Word and saying when He says serve here or do this, you're like, okay, sir, I'm going to do it. As simple as that. See, the children of Israel... They were satisfied with less. Say that again. The children of Israel were satisfied with less than what God had wanted for them. You follow me? They were satisfied with less. But God wanted much more for them. They didn't walk totally away from God. It's not like on a full apostate type of situation, but only partially. And in that decision, they were satisfied with less. When you and I, we satisfy ourselves only with less than what God's better way is for us, we will never be fully what God wants for us. Never. Because we're only partial. It's not full. They had the power. They had the authority. God was with them in every single way. They just didn't believe the word they heard. Simple. They just didn't believe it. You and I, I speak for myself as well. I think we need to be better at believing That when the Spirit speaks to us in that still, small voice, we must believe it. We must listen and do it. When the Spirit speaks to us, when we read His Word, we must read it, receive it, and do it. How else are we going to accomplish what God has for us? Are you really satisfied with less? A less Spirit-filled, power-filled life? In Christ, and I'm not talking anything wacky or strange here. I'm talking about the power of God by His Spirit. Are you satisfied with less? I'm not. I'm not satisfied with a less fulfilling life in Christ. I'm not satisfied with living a life that is partial of what He has for me. Absolutely not. I want... I desire that full power life in Christ. I need it. And I want it. 
I pray you do too. Jeremiah 24, 7 says, a way to accomplish this. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole hearts. God's giving you a heart to know Him, that He is the Lord. God's giving you the understanding that you belong to Him, that you're His kids, you're His children. He's giving you the understanding to know that He is your God. Do you know the voice of Jesus? Do you know His voice? How close are you to Jesus to know His voice? If you're one of His sheep, you'll know His voice. God is giving you the capacity. God is giving you the ability for knowing Him, for knowing who He is. And it's been given to us by His Holy Spirit. You and I, you and I, we must not be satisfied with a lesser life in Christ. God has so much for you. God has died for you and for me that we would have a full life, an abundant life. Exceedingly abundantly, He's given it to us. The choice is really you. The choice is really yours. And for those who are listening tonight, the choice is yours. Do you want a life that is filled with power, incredible, dynamic power by His Spirit? Are there things in your life that are keeping you, preventing you from living a life that is fully, 100% victorious and satisfying? I cannot be ever satisfied with living a partial life in Christ. Never. God didn't design me that way and he hasn't designed you that way either. He's designed you and me to live a life that is fully immersed, baptized in him. That's the life he's made for you and for me to have. We cannot, you cannot live a life and say, oh, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus, yet only be satisfied with less. To me, that's an oxymoron. How could I live a lesser life when I've got the king of kings and the creator of the universe residing in me? How is that possible? Well, it's possible because I allow it. It's possible because I only allow so much in the floodgate. That's why it's possible. You say you know Jesus. You say you know him then evaluate your life. Take a good, strong look at your life. And you know, you know, as I know, deficiencies, inadequacies, areas of my life where I've let stuff in that is not edifying, that is not pleasing to God. That should be your litmus test. Is what I'm doing pleasing to you, Lord? Is what I'm doing pleasing to you? And if it's not, kill it. Kill it. Be merciless with it. Show it no mercy. God wants you to live a life in Him, a full life in Him, not a partial life. Be full on. For Jesus. You say you know Jesus, then start following Jesus close. Start living a life that demonstrates that you have the power of God in you and you cannot contain it. 
Because that oil of that lamp in you burns so incredibly bright. It's inexhaustible, never ending, always giving. That's the kind of life I want. That's the kind of life I desire. That's the kind of life that that I kill my flesh for daily. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you show us by your word how intimately involved you are in our lives, how intimately you want to be involved in our lives. What wonderful blessings you have for us. What great counsel you have to give us. Lord, I, I, I pray, Lord, that by this study this evening, that those listening and those here this evening and those watching, Lord, would, would know that they have the ability and the capacity to live a life that is in victory, not in defeat, and not victory only in the high places when we are up high there with you, Jesus, looking up into the clouds, seeing the thousands upon thousands of chariots, yet when we are in the lowlands, we shrink and we shrivel up from disbelief. Lord, help every one of us who are dealing with sin. Help us, God. We need your help. We want your help because we want to live a full, victorious life in you. Hey, with your eyes still closed and your heads bowed down, if there is anyone here this evening that this message, this Bible study is spoken to, and you say, I want a victorious life, a life 100% sold out for Jesus. I want to eradicate the sin in my life. I want to do away with that. I don't want it to control me. I don't want to live a lesser life. I want to live the promise of a fullness of life in Christ. If that's you, then raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you. Thank you guys. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who lifted their hands. I thank you, God, that they they know and they see and they receive your word this evening, Lord. Not out of guilt or condemnation, but out of thankfulness. That, Lord, that you love them so much that you allow them to look in a mirror and see and say, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Lord. I need your power. I need your strength. Lord, I pray as they have asked that you give them that desire of their heart, Lord, that you help them believe that they have that power to overcome that they believe that they have the power to to be victorious, Lord, that they believe in your word. They don't shun away from it. They don't allow doubt nor circumstance to creep in to devalue your word or to second-guess it, Lord, but may they wholeheartedly, like Caleb, follow your word. May you allow them to experience that incredible spirit-filled life, 100% fully on fire for God. Give them the confidence, the boldness, the ability to say no to sin. Whatever it is, God, let them walk away from it, never to return, leaving it at the cross. Let them, Lord, have an opportunity to see the real Jesus the one who can overcome just by his spirit. Anything that gets in the way of our relationship with you. Bless them, God, I pray. And Lord, if there's anyone else here that just desires 
that incredible life. May they just ask, Lord. You tell us that we don't receive because we don't ask. May they just ask it tonight, Lord. A fully satisfying life in Christ. Not the lesser, but the fuller. Not the least, but the most. Not the half, but the full. God, thank you for this time of Bible study this evening. Thank you for those who you brought here, Lord. They, you knew that they needed to hear this word. I praise you for your word, Lord. I praise you for your spirit. I praise you, Lord. Lord, may we walk in faith and may we walk in praise as we enter in to the land, the land that you want us to conquer. May we praise you the whole way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys.